on behalf of Meril and marketing team of Meril, I Deepak Sharma welcome all the delegates for this Hernia West on abdominal wall repair. Before we move on to the main session, I would like to play a small video which will give, give you a glimpse about what Meril is all about. Uh, may I request Sudhir to play the video? Today's webinar is truly a global summit because we have participations from more than 30 countries with more than 1000 plus uh, delegates who are watching it live from across all the continent from Latin America to Asia Pacific. So this makes it a truly global summit of the sorts I would say. With this I warmly welcome Padma Shri Dr. Pradeep Chobe from India. Dr. Salvador Morales from Spain, Dr. Masha Smitansky from Poland. Uh, in fact, it's a privilege and honor for Merrill to host three stalwarts of this nature who have contributed immensely on the field of hernia surgery for the last two decades. Today's session will be moderated by Dr. Masha Smitansky. Let me give you some brief about Dr. Smitansky. He is head of the unit for Swiss Med Hospital, Dansk, Poland. He is amongst a few surgeons in the international faculty, I would say, who are masters in abdominal wall repair. He has been an active panel member on the European Hernia Guidelines, which were published in 2015, which is still is a reference paper for many surgeons across the world. An author and co-author for more than 80 publications on the field of hernia, with many pathfinding on the subject. Before I hand over to Dr. Smithansky, I would request all the delegates and participants to post their questions on the chat box, which will be transferred and shared to Dr. Smithansky by our team, who will take them with the panelists towards the end of the session in the QA part, and that would be addressed. Over to Dr. Smithansky, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deepak. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, be a part of such a, uh, a fantastic uh, meeting, and I would like to uh, welcome uh, all who are joining us. It's a pity that I, can, uh, that I cannot see you because it's all the time better to have a personal contact, but still, uh, we are very happy that you are on the computers. Uh, so, I think we can uh, slowly start it, and I would like to welcome uh, my two old uh, friends, very well-known people in the, let's call it, hernia business. And first, uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Chobe, uh, who will uh, guide the first uh, 
uh, speech and will tell about this how we can go from the uh, just repair to the to the proper uh, reconstruction because this is something like crossing the borders and this is something like uh, make um, transgression from the old surgery to the new concept and this uh, concept now it's uh, very Im important so Dr. Prolip Chobe, uh, who is one of the most uh, uh, influenced uh, uh, surgeon in Asia, and um, I think the most representative and most well-known in India. Uh, he is a uh, founder of uh, Asia Pacific Kernia so so Society, and we are uh, I had the pleasure also to be in many guidelines group and uh, we have joined uh, uh, together or uh, this uh, kind of uh, creative groups. So Pradeep, I think you can start the talk. Uh, thank you very much and uh, good evening everybody. It's a great honor and a pleasure and uh, to be part of this uh, very interesting discussion organized by Merrill. Thanks uh, Merrill and the team. They have been up to it and it's a very dynamic team. I have witnessed a uh, lot of their activities uh, in, in uh, their own place, Wapi, which is a beautiful place. A great uh, uh, support system and the great manufacturing units and a very good culture of the organization. So it's a, it, gets, it gives me a great uh, pleasure. And uh, it's a pleasure of meeting my two very senior colleagues which I think we have been crisscrossing the world and meeting. One day you are meeting on uh, uh, one uh, country and next time we are meeting a couple of weeks later in the another subcontinent. And I think we were very active and we were making the guidelines because it was a very frequent meeting. So with that, um, I would uh, like to share my uh, screen. And I hope once you tell me that you're getting the screen. Uh, is the screen? Are you able to get my screen? Yes, sir. Yes, okay. sir. Okay. All right. So, um, of course, I bring uh, uh, greetings from uh, New Delhi, India, and uh, Asian subcontinent uh, to all of you who are there, and uh, with my team at Max uh, Institute of Minimal Access Metabolic and uh, Bariatric uh, Surgery, which is uh, the center of excellence for the various subjects. So, uh, my uh, way I'm going to present today is a little different because we are going to have a master presentation after my presentation. So, I thought I will just walk you through from the concept of repair to reconstructions. So, I think it is important for every one of us and especially uh, it is aimed at our young surgeons and also not so young surgeons who are moving from repair to reconstruction and uh, my theme would be to say how the world started uh, thinking about the surgery for hernia and as we know that the concept was to repair and what repair you want to do you repair the defect so that the the bowel and the bulge and the abdominal viscera doesn't come out then it was at the same time, it, not always, but I think it's quite often restore the shape and deformity uh, produced by hernia. And of course, uh, I think when we started all of us, our career, we were only talking about recurrence. So the technique which was best repair was the technique which produced least amount of recurrences in long term. So we talk about a basin is repair, a shoulder is repair. So that was a concept of a tissue repair. And any technique which could give us practically the close to the zero figure recurrences was supposed to be the unique and the most uh, sought after technique and most uh, um, commonly performed technique. And of course, I think in last about maybe two decades we have added to avoid chronic pain, especially in the groin hernia, we talk about the chronic pain. I think in the past we did not really pay much attention to the uh, groin pain, 
but i must also tell everyone that groin pain could be very very debilitating condition for a simple surgery like hernia because they find it very difficult to wear the trousers to press the accelerator the brake so every time you climb up the stairs the chronic groin pain makes it very very miserable for that patient and we are not going into that this thing but this is what the repair was supposed to have minimum possible recurrences and practically no uh, chronic uh, groin pain and as we evolved over this you know like in last 4 5 decades we started talking not of tissue repair but we started talking of a tension free prosthetic repair so there were two criteria for a successful uh, uh, hernia surgery and also uh, for a, a good outcome it was one was a tension there should be no tension on the repair another was there has to be some use of processes in terms of mesh or any other material and it soon became the gold standard and i am talking much before even the laparoscopic surgery came in when the three decades back the laparoscopy came in then the debate started whether that tensionless prosthetic repair has to be done by conventional method or by laparoscopic method but again that was not a debate because we know that um, uh, the word at the moment which we talk about the abdominal wall reconstruction awr basically at our young age we have heard about this awr by by our plastic surgeons because the plastic surgeons were doing abdominal wall reconstruction they were uh, using uh, how to close the wound especially the gunshot wounds where the abdominal wall was damaged then they were also in the oncological situations where there was a loss of the uh, wall because of the uh, certain types of tumor and also they were restructuring the tissue but i would like your attention to be paid to the last point it was to reinforce the integrity of the muscle so when we are talking about the reconstruction which is a true abdominal wall reconstruction i think we have to pay a lot of attention to reinforcement of the integrity of the abdominal wall muscles rather than possibly damaging those muscle so this is the point i think when we talk about awr this is what important point should be considered when we talked about really it's very interesting and uh, i think every time you look at this chart uh, i i i always feel that how things have changed look at uh, the uh, publication in 1985 to 88 they were talking about the inguinal hernia is almost about you know uh, uh, three fourth of patients were having inguinal hernia some female patient mostly had a femoral hernia the incidence was quite high and then they were talking about umbilical and of course others so you look at here the others were just about 1 to 2% but another study conducted in 2005 and 2008 you see the inguinal hernias have reduced in frequency maybe the patients were operated maybe the you know uh, some other uh, reasons because also here i would like to point out that inguinal hernia is less common in obese patients so as the obesity came into picture we started seeing less inguinal hernias because obesity is uh, known to reduce the incidence of inguinal hernia contrary to many of us who believe that but it increases the umbilical hernia it increases the epigastric hernia it increases the incisional hernias parastomal hernias so this is what you know the things have changed when we talk in 2000 uh, 1985 and then we talk about 2005 so this is the point now once we have talked i think not much controversy is there about inguinal umbilical paraumbilical hernias most of the problems of reconstruction occurs for the incisional hernia which at that time was 4.8% with increasing obesity it might have increased a little bit more but i think by and large when we talk about reconstruction i think this is the main area and this is the main type of hernias which we talk when we talk again of incisional hernia it is not only 
the incisional hernia that every incisional hernia will need a reconstruction but maybe less than 1% maybe 2% depending on the uh, place where we are uh, sort of counting the numbers so less than 1% of 4.8 or 5% will need a reconstruction so i think by and large the reconstruction will be needed in selected few patients mostly they are the long standing hernias which are there which has not been taken care of well it goes beyond uh, doubt that minimally invasive surgery minimal access surgery really uh, it changed the surgical world at the same time it changed the hernia repair as well and we uh, know that the minimally invasive surgery suddenly became very very popular option for uh, hernia repair because of the less pain early recovery and uh, resumption of work but also technically seeing that we had a minimal wound complication with laparoscopy because the mesh is not coming in contact with any of the ports and also we had a very very less or almost zero surgical site occurrences which includes even the recurrences and the infections and lesions etc but that made the eye pump very very popular surgery because i think you know after laparoscopic cholecystectomy 3 decades back when we started uh, uh, in the asian subcontinent i think quickly we moved on to eye pump repair because now this technique by far is almost about um, studies about about 25 to 30 years studies are now available for long term evaluation it was reasonably easy and uh, we started doing it and then you know quickly we uh, modified our technique to uh, uh, see that the mesh is centralized with the uh, um, uh, hernia opening because you know the mesh used to be displaced left and right then then of course the their multi centric trials which came and the industrial support was phenomenal because we got a very specialized high generation protected meshes which were used especially for eye pump because before that there was only gortex mesh which was available and the proline and marlex mesh were available but as eye pump became popular i think industry uh, made a, a big uh, contribution by coming out by high generation protected meshes what we have we are seeing now uh, and of course the morbidity and mortality was very very less especially when we talk about the primary hernias maybe sometimes an atrotomies were taking in dense adhesions when we were talking about the incisional hernias so i think laparoscopic repair is definitely advantages in terms of shorter hospital stay shorter learning curve and you know is still remains uh, fairly uh, popular but uh, there were um, very uh, distinct advantages that it could be done even in a high risk patients when you want a shorter anesthesia you don't want much to dissect the diabetic patients the obese patients and of course lesser experienced team or team which is experienced with the cholecystectomy and appendectomies could also also move over to laparoscopic hernia repair so i would say that uh, eye pump is one technique which really Uh, brought laparoscopy in the arena of hernia repair and now i think we have millions and millions of cases across the globe uh, which is uh, documented and there and uh, the points which has been raised again and again against eye pump or there were some apprehensions about eye pump was that it is a bridge repair what you are bridging the gap with the mesh but soon i think we are talking about the sutured repair the suturing the gap and then putting in a mesh so that is possibly is getting away but i think the biggest problem was interperitoneal mesh placement which was contributed for causing the bowel adhesions to the mesh but i think with the various types of uh, separations and the films which are available that i think became less and less and i very strongly believe that when we started the hernia surgery there were a lot of serosal injuries which were taking to the bowel and that serosa was getting adherent to the uh, mesh 
and possibly the initial studies have shown more chances of adhesions. But I think the problem arises with large and complex hernias when we talk about. So uh, I think we can change this. So I think if we really uh, go and see that the serious objections were there for intraperitoneal placement. And e even in the guidelines, you know, our EAS guidelines and world guidelines, I think well, all of us, three of us, we have been also involved in this. It was especially uh, uh, emphasis was given, but at the same time, it was concluded in practically all the guidelines that IPOM is, is a laparoscopic and is a safe surgery with a, with a very, very good available incidence. Now, if you look at the mesh related complication, of course, in open, and I'm talking about just the mesh related complications, we're high on the conventional surgery as compared to the laparoscopic surgery. And that is the time, I think all of us in, in the world, the serious herniologists, the believers in laparoscopy and the the super specialized herniologists, they started thinking, what is the way out? And I think uh, uh, I, I, uh, I recollect how we were desperate at that time because the high generation meshes were not really so easily available. And if at all they were available, they were very expensive and difficult to uh, acquire. But I think, you know, the first attempt uh, which we made was a couple of us years after we started. And this is my first publication in 2003, which uh, was published. Uh, and I started uh, uh, thinking with our team to place the mesh outside the peritoneum. And that was possibly uh, a very uh, 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 novel cause and very new concept at that time. And the first paper uh, of mesh going outside was published, though it was a very small time um, a group of patients we published we had just about 34 patients and the most of the cases were primary hernias and of course the incisional hernias where we had difficulty multiple uh, openings and uh, uh, in the peritoneum so i think this is i would say this is the time in the late 90s when we all started thinking of putting the mesh outside and we used to put the simple proline mesh uh, without any coat and the peritoneum was the the natural protection to prevent the adhesion and today i think today we are also practically talking about the same thing and then came the various spaces we were talking about a preperitoneal then they went into the retroractors retromuscular and also we started talking about the etp space but what i would like now you see this has become a new playground. And I'm sure the modern herniologists and the serious uh, players who are doing exclusive hernia surgery as like a, one of our centers, I, we started concentrating more in placement of the mesh into retroractors, retromuscular or ETP space, which is gradually uh, now we see. And this is the new playground which has come for the herniologists. And of course, I'm not going into the detail. I'm sure you all know about ETAP approach, or various levels where you put in a mesh. And I'm sure each subject is one full um, subject and goes needs to go into details. But I think all set and done for midline hernias, which are smaller hernias or moderate size hernias, still I think intraperitoneal mesh was and is an according to my understanding possibly is going to be the future uh, of it. And in certain cases, we will really go to the retrorectal uh, spaces. So I think this is simply, we talk about TP. You see that TP, the space which we were using, just about the supra pubic space. And the cross which I have made has appeared in the ETP. So we have, for putting that 15 by 15 mesh, unfortunately, we have increased the area of dissection. Uh, is it too much uh, dissection for too little? Maybe simple TEP or TAPP became little more complication. And the linear alba also uh, needed to be disrupted. And posterior 
you know, separation was a big problem. Duration was more, pain was more. And unfortunately, the ports were higher so that the cosmetically they were not really going well. Whereas the, you know, infra umbilical ports were simpler and easier. And I think the many years back, we had this odd situation where the post, the linear alba gave in, gave way. And there was a large, massive hernia, which needed to be de 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 dealt. And this was the case. We remember that the whole bubble has gone into the, uh, through the midline. You can see the mesh. Of course, we had to put in a bigger mesh as a eye palm and to repair uh, it like that. So I think we still feel that before you go to TAR, I'm going to just my coming to my conclusion because I think um, uh, Salvador will take over from there. We talk more about the, when we talk about TAR, we are adding one more space. So the retro, uh, the retro pubic space is a uh, rich space, rich space with ETP has gone up and we sort of, you know, divided the uh, linear alba. But when you talk about TAR, you are involving another space, which is, which is there, you know, this is space we are involving here. So then there are three spaces which are involved. That should be kept in mind that these are the three places, uh, spaces which are involved. We also must give good importance and lot of importance to the abdominal musculature. We know that we have a sternal oblique, internal oblique, and the rectus. These are the three muscles which are uh, responsible for movement of the body. And of course, we talk about the um, transverses. Transverses is a stabilizer. It is very, very vital muscle which stabilizes and is attached to the uh, chest and to the spine and to the pelvis and to the inguinal. You know, it's a one muscle which is involved and it's a very important muscle for respiratory uh, system because it dividing it also uh, needs very caution because it can give rise to chronic uh, pain in the spine, maybe a negative feedback loop, which is very uh, important to understand and a repetitive micro trauma because there's no muscle to protect and to keep the spines and things in place. Of course, respiratory functions along with the diaphragm is the most crucial part of the function of the transverses muscle. And when I look at the aircraft, I think, you know, uh, I don't know why this is, this is my favorite slide that when I said, when you are really dividing or rearranging the abdominal muscle, I think we should keep it in mind very seriously that we are possibly disturbing the tail end of the aircraft. It has got a vertical stabilizer, rudder, uh, elevator, horizontal stabilizer. So abdominal muscles are very crucial for stabilizing our body, for the movement of our body, and for keeping our body intact, and also providing accessory respiratory uh, assistance. And that is why whenever we are looking at these muscles, we have to be very, very careful. Now, we talk about the bridging. Now, I think most of the surgeons across the globe for IPOM and other things, they are trying to close. But we, when we talk about the muscle division, there is also a bridging. The mesh is placed separately and we remove, we divide the muscle. So the muscle gets separated and there is also a bridging which is required in that. And this is one of the uh, patients we, we came to us. This was a patient who had a tar and his all intestines migrated, herniated from the tar incision into the outside the abdomen and which needed a big mess. We see a lot of complications also. This is how it looks uh, sometimes. This is a conventional work. It looks uh, like this. And next day you find that the patient is having fever. Then you go in and you do the debridement and then it doesn't work, then the fever continues and before multi-organ failure takes place, you remove the mesh and do the wound management. And then this, again, you have to repeatedly go and do the debridement and put the wound management systems again and again, and you find it in a big mess. So what the word of caution is that when we talk about the reconstruction, we should be, first of all, our training has to be a very, very Im immaculate training. 
a very very long learning curve so we should train ourselves very well under the the dedicated herniologists who are uh, well versed about the abdominal muscle movements and also the origin and insertions etc because the complications of reconstruction could be really really disastrous so we should not land up in ourselves into that situation and as i said the this is the hernia patient it's a benign condition and when whatever we do our patient should look like this but if we do not do it well without training with less training not keeping things in mind then probably the same reconstruction could look like this which is very very uh, harmful and dangerous for the patient and also has got lot of uh, issues related with this so i think whenever we are doing a hernia repair either we are doing a repair or a reconstruction we should see what is the risk involved and we see what reward the patient is going to get and that is what is the balance must understand that you know it is when repair and reconstruction i think you should put yourself in this condition and you should see that whether you will be able to do the reconstruction well with the benefit to the patient otherwise the situation could be something like this which i think nobody should have because it is not the surgeon but also the patient is at great risk and this is what everybody needs to assess ourselves with our uh, team and with the infrastructure which is available to us so coming to the conclusion hernia is a benign condition it's a non life threatening condition less is more in hernia repair in the primary reconstruction of midline and the closure of hernia defect in all patients may not be possible or sometimes not desirable and the reconstructive techniques are complex in nature needs a serious herniologist dedicated herniologist to do that and the training becomes very very important for them and the reconstruction at the cost of destruction should be avoided as far as possible and thank you very much uh, uh, for your patience listening we will now move on to the next presentation over to you ms thank you very much pradeep it is uh, there are some questions that came to us but i think uh, after salva's talk we can uh, because they are you know talking about some um, additional uh, maneuvers uh, in a, a let's say hernia re reaper i just would like to uh, ask you one question uh, after this this presentation um on one of the slides uh, there was something like the uh, incidence of the incisional hernia reaper 4.8 per uh, 8 percent it seems that in uh, different countries the the the, uh, the amount of incisional uh, hernia reaper it's completely different like for example we have a, a data from german hernia database and this seems to be even 35 percent of all uh, hernia operation do you think that uh, it depends on how many patients have been operated before and if the level of medicine is higher so the people will live longer and they will have a time to have the incisional one i quite agree with you and that is that actually is not uh, the indian experience but it is the study which is published you know so i quoted in that about mm -hmm. the uh, published this thing they have shown the inguinal hernia going down and they contributed to the obesity because obesity reduces the chances of inguinal hernia and it increases the chances of incisional hernia and um, that is that is what it was there but i quite mm -hmm. agree with you the thing the percentage which they have quoted may not be that i agree or you agree with that but that is why i quoted the study with that Uh, name of the study and is uh, uh, 2011 publication uh, of that study mm -hmm. and it was from 2005 to 2008 mm -hmm. and it has been seen in the hospital one particular mm -hmm. group uh, which okay. they have published mm -hmm. so i quite agree with you that it may be much more than what we talk about yes so thank you very much i can i, I think we can move to the next presentation so let me shortly introduce uh, dr sarah 
what I come there from Sevilla in in Spain and uh, similar to Pradeep he has also a lot of titles but uh, just to uh, let you know uh, he is now uh, our general secretary of the European Hernia Society and he's um, involved in many activities and also uh, has been involved in many groups for the standards and guidelines working now uh, specializing in uh, minimal in, uh, invasive surgery uh, not only in hernia but also in uh, upper gi tract uh, and bariatric so uh, salva i think you can speak Okay, thank you, Mace. Uh, thank you, uh, the Murray Academy, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to collaborate with this initiative. Um, of course, I wish I could be with my two good friends, uh, Pradeep Chobi, uh, Mace Smetansky, together in some place and enjoy our friendship. But, you know, these times are times to uh, keep training and educating people. And this tool of the uh, sharing our screen from our house uh, I think it's important to continue the improve of the of hernia surgery as we are doing today. So I'm going to show you my my experience and and the way I I title my my presentation, uh, which is aligned with the presentation of Dr. Chowe, Chowe uh, is uh, is called the new trends in minimal invasive abdominal wall reconstruction. I agree with uh, Pradeep that uh, we don't talk about a repair. We talk about how to do abdominal wall reconstruction today. And this is applied not only to open surgery, but also to minimal invasive surgery. At the beginning of this, uh, um, this concept was attached, was uh, uh, linked to, to open surgery while uh, laparoscopic surgery, the uh, surgeons were breaching. And today it's linked also to minimal, in, minimal invasive surgery. I will give you a, gla a glance of uh, what is innovation and revolution. I think innovation is a change that introduced novelty, uh, novelties uh, modifying existing elements. And, and a revolution is a fundamental change. And if we talk about revolution in uh, abdominal wall surgery, I would say that in the last 30 years, there is two revolutions. One is the systematic use of meshes uh, today, that I think when they was, uh, where, where I started becoming a surgeon, uh, it was the start of the world of meshes. And the other revolution uh, today is to do this minimal invasive abdominal wall reconstruction. And the reason of this steel revolution because it's a fundamental change. Uh, and this is what, uh, how this minimal invasive the abdominal wall reconstruction start. Everything started in 1993, 1991, the first case, uh, that there was a laparoscopic ventral hernia repair. At those time, we had the revolution of laparoscopic surgery and also was applied to ventral hernia repair. And this was, was, it was called at that moment, uh, lap ipon And this lap ipon as uh, it was, uh, uh, was an acronym of the use of intraperitoneal mesh to repair a ventral hernia. But at that time, uh, we were using uh, these tuckers, which uh, this is one of the patients that I need to reoperate. And you see that we will feel very comfortable with this uh, image when we have to reoperate a, a patient and we can see this adhesions to the to the old tucker and also uh, when we have to reoperate a patient uh, the meshes that we use in at that moment were the shrinks and you can see these all uh, still in the market and we use it in some cases and it's a good mesh for some indication uh, this is the old PDF that we were using in 100% of the cases and you see the shrinkage of the mesh and also when we evaluate our patient by CT scan most of the time we saw this, uh, the so-called pseudo recurrence, bulging, and we call it in a different ways, but we didn't like to accept that this was a failure of the technique. Uh, and the good thing is that we, don't, we didn't have to reoperate this patient because the patient have a small bulging, but they didn't complain and it was asymptomatic. But we were not happy uh, looking at our CT scan of our patients and see this image. But even with these three images, if you compare the literature up to 19, uh, 2017, that I, I, I make this uh, um, analysis of the literature, and you compare, 
compare the open approach with this classic iPod, everything was better. Uh, um, wood infection, hospital stay, quality of life, and cost was better with the classic open, open uh, the classic lab iPod. And only in open surgery, there was less bowel injury. And in the other one, in terms of pain, recurrence, and return to activity, there was no difference regarding open and classic lab iPod. So even we have excellent results, we didn't like much this technique. And that's the reason why we moved from this lab iPod, from these images, to uh, this minimal invasive abdominal wall reconstruction in which we can see these new meshes uh, well uh, uh, integrated in the abdominal wall. And you can see a patient that this, this is not a normal patient. This is a patient that I did an, um, an abdominal wall reconstruction by minimal invasive surgery. And you can see how the wall is totally reconstructed. So this change is very, very, very important. So what has he, he changed in, in this journey from 1993 to 2020, 2019, when we start calling this abdominal wall reconstruction. So in this journey, the first, let's say, fight that we have to deal with as a surgeon was to deal with this image of, in which we can observe this uh, bulging. And everything started changing in 2007 when Eli Chelala uh, published this paper. Of course, there were some surgeons that were closing the defect before, but the first paper that have an impact, an important impact, was this paper from Eli Chelala. And in this paper, what he uh, mentioned, and this was called IPOM Plus, what he mentioned is that you avoid the bulging, you re reinforce the abdominal wall, which increased functionality. And one of the main messages at that moment was that avoid seroma. And many surgeons start publishing their studies, how to close the defect, how to do it with different technique. But I have to be honest, and at the beginning, I was totally against that because the first way of describing this technique was by doing what I show you here, which, is, was, uh, which was my first and only case that I did closing the defect this way. Uh, we were doing transpassive suture, joining the two edges, and I have to tell you that I didn't like the way it looks like. And the reason is because this was bite of tissue producing pain, and you can see the tears in the peritoneum, the fascia, producing uh, uh, sun. Uh, of course, it was going to be related to sun recurrence. So I didn't like to do this, and in fact, I did one case, and I stopped. So what I start with my group is, let's say, we have to do something different, and let's mimic what we do in, lapar in, and in, in, in open surgery. So I took the same suture that we were using to close the abdomen, and I said, well, I'm going to do it the same way. I'm going to do a running suture. I'm going to maintain the thread up inside, outside. I'm going to go little by little introducing, and at the end, I'm going to take the two uh, lines, not just the whole, reconstruct the whole linea alba, join together the muscle, and then pull, reduce the nemoperitoneo, and close the linea alba, which was totally different. And at that moment, I start believing in this technique. The question will be, what is the main difference between iPhone and this iPhone Plus in which the, uh, we were closing the defect? There is some data, and in 2014, one of the first papers showing the advantage showed that there was less recurrence, less bulging, less seroma, and the patient were, had, were showing more satisfaction when they were closing the defect. And uh, last year, we have a, a trial that it was published in Annals of Surgery in which also was showing that the advantage of the iPhone Plus over the conventional iPhone that, that improved the quality of life of the patient. So this iPhone Plus has something special to offer to those who believe in laparoscopic surgery. But at that moment, when we learned how to close the defect with this running suture, we wonder which was going to be our limit to close this defect. And suddenly, when we start following our patient and, and following our patient and doing CT scan one month and one year after surgery, you can see that in those defects, more than 10 centimeter after one month was okay. But after 10, uh, one year, we have the same problem. The, there was an opening of the defect and there was again the bulging. So, uh, we learned at the same time that this paper published by Nail Smart that over 10 centimeter width 
you should go to do a component separation. So that was our first conclusion when we start doing this study. And we decide to go uh, with the laparoscopic TAR better to an endoscopic anterior component separation. And in the systematic review that we published this year in surgical endoscopy, we have observed that these uh, laparoscopic TAR have better result that the, than the endoscopic component separation. And you can see here how uh, uh, this group of patients uh, with an uh, uh, TAR have less recurrence and similar complication with a pure uh, endoscopic component separation following by laparoscopic follow, uh, component separ uh, endoscopic uh, component separation and laparoscopic placement of the mesh. So we were aligned and we uh, thought that laparoscopic TAR for those patients over 10 centimeters was the solution. So uh, um, the second question was, well, it's okay what I see, but what about uh, the long lasting reconstruction? So we observed this with more than 10, but what happened with less than 10? It's going to be a long lasting reconstruction. And the other question that we have was uh, if this closure was going to be linked to more pain. So we uh, keep following our patient with def def defect of 10 centimeter width, everything was fine, but from five to 10 centimeter, we start observing some um, problems. And these problems was, if you follow this line, you could see that from five to 10, uh, this, was, this was the width preoperative. This was the width of the two rectal muscle one month after surgery, and you can see after one year, it didn't get to the value uh, of previous surgery, but it was increased uh, to four centimeters. So this shows you that little by little by time, it will open. And this showed you the difference of less than five centimeters would happen one year later that opened just one centimeter, but the median after, uh, from five to 10 after one year, the median opening was more than three centimeters. So that means, that after uh, five centimeter, um, less than five centimeters, that was the same conclusion on the paper on Nain Smart, closing the difference was fine, but from five to 10, something new had to be done. We analyzed what happened. We analyzed in this uh, patient what happened. Uh, and in this 60 patient, we have a recurrence rate of 6% and a bulging of 20% and the severe uh, pulmonary obstructive, chronic obstructive uh, disease um, we ha was one of the factors related to this opening, but also, again, we observed that the main, main, most important factor was the hernia itself, the width from 4.5 to 9 centimeters. So that gives you the idea that uh, less than 5 is okay closing the defect, always with a running suture, but from five to 10, if you join together the edges of the, uh, of the, the defect, after a period of time was going to open. And that was easy. That was something that we did in peaks. We observed that in the control group, uh, if you just place the mesh against intact peritoneum, there was a small amount of fibroblasts and new vessels. But if you place the mesh, against a peritoneum in which you create an inflammatory process, the number of fibroblasts and new vessels was going to be increased. What does this mean? That if you join together, uh, uh, peritoneum against peritoneum of the edge of the defect is going to open. And that's the reason why I decide to develop a technique. And in, and in 2015, we start thinking on an alternative and we develop uh, the LIDA technique. And what is the LIDA technique? The LIDA technique is an opening of the fascia, uh, uh, at the, uh, at the fascia like a couple centimeter from, from the, far from the edge of the defect, and then flip the fascia to the midline, close it by closing the midline, you join together the fascia and there will be a healing process here, and the mesh was going to be integrated in a naked uh, muscle in which the integration was going to be higher. So, this is the way uh, we do it. You can see how we were opening the fascia. We were making this uh, flap of fascia. And once we finished, uh, we were able to do a running suture uh, to close together 
to close together the the two flip the two fla flap of fascia and joining together and by pulling and uh, this incision at the same time you were reducing the tension you were joining together the muscle in the linea alba so you see here the closure and you see here how the muscle most of the muscle came together to the linea alba so this is something and of course then was reinforced by the mesh so if then what we did the next step was to compare what we are having with the uh, uh, prospective analysis of this primary fascial closure with the lira technique and you see the difference uh, the blue line was the opening after a standard closure of the midline how move from less than two uh, uh, centimeter to 4.5 and here you can see after a year with the LIDA technique it will maintain almost the same just a difference of a couple centimeter millimeter between uh, the CT scan after one year one month and the CT scan after one year so that give you uh, give us the idea that this worked and this it was going to be a long-lasting reconstruction for those hernia with a width of five to 10 centimeter. And the reason it was easy to understand, it was because it was going to be a better healing process. But at the same time, by de doing this opening, we were going to release the tension in the midline. And by releasing the tension, we were going to have less pain. And that was what we observed. And we observe the vast scale between the closing the defect and the lira. You see a significant decrease of pain after doing the lira technique compared uh, with closing the defect during the first uh, the first week. So this is what we have. We have better healing process, no tension, a loss lancing reconstruction, less pain with the lira technique, and then we decide where, why we don't go to less than five also and do this elita. And what we did is to do this elita. And the difference basically was to open the rectal muscle in, at the edge of the, uh, the fascia of the rectal muscle at the edge, uh, at the middle edge of them, including the weakening of the incision and also the diastasis in case of a primary hernia associated to diastasis. So you see how they come together in the linea alba, and then we were placing uh, the mesh. So uh, then what you see that it was pure minimal, uh, minimal abdominal wall reconstruction. And in fact, we have a small series in which we say, well, if we have less tension and we have a healing process, why don't we use an absorbable mesh? And using an absorbable, long-term absorbable mesh maybe we got a goal of reoperating the patient later, uh, years later, without no mesh and without any fixation in the abdominal wall. And this is what we have. This is a patient. This is the patient I show you the video. This is what we have. Uh, it looks like nothing happened. And I show you something really new because I operate this patient last Monday of a colonic cancer. And this patient that I operate, that you show the video of the technique, then you show the video one year follow up, and this is an intraoperative image of the same patient uh, three years uh, later in which I was operating the patient of a colonic cancer. And you can see the linea, the new linea alba, some little spot of the old mesh in the middle and everything seems that the patient have a new abdominal wall. So uh, this gives you a chance to also start thinking because when we start doing the LIDA, we were using a steel detector. But uh, Tucker, and the reason was because we know from some paper that even tuckers are related to more adhesions, as you see here, the strength was uh, more important than uh, the uh, absorbable fixation device. And this, uh, it was also shown with, uh, uh, in this paper from Rosenberg, when you close the defect, you need permanent tucker to have better result. But uh, since we were using uh, this technique of the LIDA in which you improve 
the uh, integration of the mesh, you can use this absorbable fixation. So at the end, what we have is that the LIDA technique give us the chance of reconstruct the linear alba, uh, decrease pain, have a long lasting reconstruction and fix meshes with absorbable fixation device, which is an important uh, message. The only uh, area of complaint of this technique is that we were still were using an intradominal mesh, and this is true. And in fact, some of the surgeons, as Pradit Chauve uh, uh, in in the late in the earlier uh, 2003, they were thinking on doing this concept of placing the mesh uh, retromuscular without being in contact with the bowel. And for example. Uh, uh, Rainbow, uh, Wolfgang Rainbow and his group described the lap souple, a technique that we do, and, and the thing is, it's like doing a TAPP in which you make a flap with the uh, fascia, and uh, it's a difficult technique because you have to manage yourself, dissect the fascia, cross over the linea alba, and go to the other side. Uh, I use this technique only in primary hernia less than five centimeters. And what I do, as you see here, is to cross to the other side. And I don't use it in incisional hernia because the fibers of the sac sometimes uh, lead you to open the, the, to open the, the peritoneum and have uh, to close it again. And it's have the fibrous tissue of previous incision make this process more difficult. So I only do this lap souple in those cases of a uh, primary hernia in which I close the muscle and I place a mesh and at the end, as you see here, I close uh, this flap uh, uh, as I do in a TAPP. Other alternative, Milos technique, again, described by uh, Wolfgang Brainpo, which is, I would say, not an easy technique uh, to develop. And the other concept is starting by our friend Jorge Daez, he also uh, described uh, the ETEP for uh, the ventral hernia together with Igor Beliansky. And this is a concept you've been used to so many surgeons. But the problem is that these techniques are more difficult. And in my opinion, to cross over to one side to the other is difficult, especially in incisional hernia. So what we have today is this. More than five, I do the lap tar, but less than five, we have if we are using a mesh intradominally, we're using the light leader technique, but if no, if you want to avoid a mesh intradominally, you can use uh, the ETEP, the MILOS of the lap souple to place the mesh uh, retromuscular. This is what we have today. This is the two uh, group of technique in, um, that you have. In my opinion, the advantage of this group, which is the leader, even that you place an intradominal mesh, in my opinion, is more reproducible and could be used in all indications, while these techniques are more complex. And in some cases in which you have previous surgery uh, uh, or you have to cross over in, with a lot of fibrous tissue are more very, very difficult to be performed. I, see, uh, I keep receiving messages, email, WhatsApp uh, from Brazil, South Africa, uh, New York, North of Spain, Greece, that are people doing little by little increasing the popularity of this technique. And this is what I do to, uh, this is, let's say that today we have all these alternatives. Less than five, uh, we have the ELIDA, the LIDA of the endoscopic component separation uh, with the laparoscopic technique. Um, uh, for no mesh abdominal, you have the laptar. Uh, and you have the reverse stop at souple. These are approach. The technique is this one. Uh, uh, these are the different approach. And what I do personally is if I have an incisional hernia, I maintain the concept of LIDA or ELIDA and doing always a laptar for those patients with more than 8, 10, and primary hernia in less than five, what I do either is a lap, uh, lap souple or you could do an, an, an ITE. And this is my concept that I do it. Of course, uh, uh, my friend Pradeep have mentioned everything could be hybrid. And in fact, uh, some cases in which I have difficulties to close the linea alba, especially in laptar, I combine. And remember always, even if you have a terrible scar, 
the good thing is that, that you do the process, uh, the technique by laparoscopy, and at the end you can remove the skin or conclude the procedure by open approach, and you always maintain the advantage of laparoscopic surgery, and you don't need a robot. If you have it, it's great, but if you don't need it in that sense. Just remember, things have changed. If we see a CT scan like this, in the past, we want to repair this hernia. But remember that this hernia is in the middle of a diastasis, and you should work in this diastasis to have a proper repair. And when you explore, uh, do a physical examination of a patient, one of the things that you have to do is to tell them to see if this hernia is in the middle of this diastasis because the treatment will be totally different. So go for this abdominal wall reconstruction. You want the linear alba reconstructed. Uh, we follow our patient. We keep working with them. A seroma, as you see here, is not the major problem. The most important thing is you join together rectal muscle. And you don't need to have a rubber. If you have... If you have it, you're going to feel more comfortable, but I just want to send you the message that this technique can be done by minimal invasive surgery. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Salva. Uh, I just would like you, before I will come to the questions uh, we got from the people, uh, I just would like to ask you both, uh, because it seems that the intraperitoneal mesh uh, is quite safe and we can use it in many cases, or even in most cases. But uh, we know that in, in the past there have been a lot of papers and the old meshes, they have not been working uh, as fantastic as they have been uh, introduced on the market. And even some of these uh, meshes uh, just have to be withdrawn uh, from the uh, market. So, um, what do you think about what is the rule of the mesh in the uh, IPOM re uh, repair? Because it seems like you concentrate on uh, this that we have to close the defect. And how to close it? It's, it's maybe better to close it with the fascia, not with the peritoneum. But uh, what is the rule of the mesh in your opinion? And do we have good meshes now or still the search for the better mesh is ongoing? Maybe well, Salva first. Uh, yeah, please. Yeah, uh, perfection, uh, perfect is not, um, is not uh, rich yet. Of course, we have better meshes than in the past. No doubt about that. Uh, it's so much better in terms that they don't produce uh, these additions at the edge. Uh, the material shrinkage less. They have less uh, amount of material because they are less weight uh, and larger pore than in the past. So we have better material. And on the other side, uh, the protection that the mesh have to avoid adhesions have improved. But there is another factor. Beside the technique, of course, surgeons are better, so they place the mesh in a better way. And this new technique allows one important point, is you can reduce this fixation with the old tucker. And tuckers were producing a lot of problem, maybe more than the mesh itself. And this is very, very important. We have to develop technique to avoid, to decrease fixation, and maybe to trust this absorbable fixation to guarantee uh, the, the, a good postoperative period. Thank you. Pradeep, what do you think about this? Put on the microphone, please. Pradeep, Pradeep. the microphone. Put on the microphone, please. Yeah. yeah, so I agree that um, the quality of mesh has quite significantly changed over a period of time. And as you talked about, some of the meshes which we are not doing well had to be withdrawn from the market uh, for various reasons. So um, I, I am a great believer in the technology and uh, technique as well. And the surgeons have learned the technique, but I feel that... Uh, over a period of time, as the things are progressing, 
and now the progress has really uh, become very very fast so i'm sure we are going to get uh, a good quality of mesh better quality of uh, separations uh, in uh, time to come and uh, as i said uh, in the beginning i think it will all depend that we try to put the mesh outside because that time the ptfe was the only for that matter the only mesh which was so called today we don't call it a mesh is we is a separation a tissue separating uh, uh, material but that time if you really recollect i think it was the only proline and ptfe which was available so i think you know that time we were more desperate to put the mesh outside and i very strongly feel that the some of the initial studies which have shown that the putting the proline uh, intra uh, abdominally can produce uh, fistulation and uh, uh, sinuses etc i very strongly believe that those times the time when we were not experienced enough to do a good additional lysis of the bowel and possibly we were injuring the cirrhosis and that the raw cirrhosis was getting stuck to the foreign body and that is true even if you are not putting any foreign body like you see cesarean scars and hysterectomy scars abdominal surgery scars the bowel is always adherent to the you know the scar tissue so it is of course the mesh is there but even if you are closing the uh, opening the peritoneum and closing the peritoneum that raw area the bowel will get adherent so what i am trying to say that time we were more desperate today i think we are not that desperate to put the mesh outside uh, because we are getting a good quality of mesh and i'm sure within couple of years we will get much quality you know we know that some uh, some companies are making the um, so called bio uh, bio synthetic meshes you know so, those, mm -hmm. so that is a you know um, uh, we see the spark that something like that may happen and suddenly we see the uh, a very rapid uh, technological development and advancement okay thank thank you very much for this uh, as i see in our chat box uh, we have a few questions that i can summarize that are touching the topic of the peritoneum because on one side we leave the sac uh, even if we close okay so we leave uh, a part of the per of the peritoneum uh, inside but on the other hand uh, it's also like this that in some techniques especially this uh, open sandwich technique like our friends in scotland are doing it we use the peritoneum to cover the mesh from both uh, uh, sides in the case of for example uh, bridging so some people believe that the peritoneum is good uh, and we can even use it and some people think that if we will leave the, the peritoneum inside it can cause problems like seroma. What is your opinion uh, about how we have to handle the 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 peritoneum? Well, uh, uh, my my feeling is that the peritoneum can only be used as a a film. I don't think peritoneum can provide any strength to the reinforcement or the to the repair. So I I I don't think peritoneum will provide. Yes, it can separate the mesh. from coming in contact with the bowel that's okay. the only uh, way and seromas by far we have not really seen seromas causing any long term problem initially people are apprehensive and we are not very much in favor of aspirating the seromas we like the seromas to uh, uh, absorb themselves over a period of time and only with a large seroma then only we think about drainage but By and large, is very far and few. Thank you. I would like to uh, mention something. Uh, Salva, just one, just one additional question, because also in the Lira technique, because you cut the peritoneum uh, also from the both uh, sides, then you close it. So a little part of the peritoneum stays in inside. Do you think that if you will cut it like this, it does not have any blood support, and maybe the peritoneum have to? necrotized inside i haven't seen any cases like that uh, we haven't we haven't have and beside that you know that peritoneum uh also have blood blood supply from the fatty tissue around and that's a reason when you can um when you 
uh, remove the, the sac. That is one of the things that I was going to tell you. Maybe you avoid seroma, but you create an hem hematoma. So, uh, so this is the, the main problem. One of the things is like in 2012, we published in Hernia a classification of seroma to state that seroma most of the time is an incident. It's something that happened that doesn't bother the patient. The most important thing is that seroma doesn't get infected. And this is the beauty of laparoscopic surgery, that the seroma is not in contact with the skin. And this is the problem in open surgery. Any seroma is in contact with the skin and you can have an infection. So you have to consider that seroma is not a problem in most of the cases. In fact, what I did, I analyzed, and we have a nice, uh, um, a nice scale in where we see the seroma uh, closing the defect and without closing the defect. The percentage of seroma is the same if you do a CT scan. Closing the defect and not closing the defect. By closing the defect, for some reason, what you get is less seroma causing a complication. So uh, the rate of complication of seroma following that classification is very, very, very low. So seroma in minimal invasive surgery, we are fortunate that is sterile, is not in contact with the skin, and is not a problem. Thank you very much. And another one question, because we have also a question like this: that the IPOM uh, meshes are usually quite expensive. And one of the questions here I see it's: uh, can we replace the very expensive uh, IPOM uh, mesh? with uh, something else, or we just should follow um, the, the technique as it is, like with the special meshes, uh, because also there have been some, some papers published that you can use a normal polypropylene mesh or something else for the iPhone te technique. Salvo. Well, uh, they, are more exp they are expensive, but you have in the market now the prices of a uh, few, few years ago and the prices today, uh, have decreased dramatically, and I can tell you, I mean, we are here with Merrill. Merrill have an excellent mesh, and it's not as, as expensive as it, was, it used to be the all the other meshes. Yeah, but still, you are in Spain, yeah? Still, uh, you are in Spain. I, uh, I'm uh, Poland, but you can imagine that there are some countries in which something like six or seven hundred uh, dollars, it's quite a lot, yeah? Yeah, but the problem is if you compare with an open technique uh, and, and you have a rate of infection of 15 to 20 percent, it's more expensive to treat an infection and to treat yeah, an I infection know. lead to, to recurrence. So infection, recurrence, uh, dealing with infection, uh, give more opportunity to have an infection. So that's going to be more expensive than using this type of mesh if you reduce infection and, uh, and recurrence. So this is my opinion. You have to balance the whole process, not only mm -hmm. what happened in the, in the OR. And this is what happened in many hospitals in Spain and worldwide. Pradeep, uh, what is your uh, experience? Because as uh, uh, a president of the uh, uh, Asia Pacific uh, uh, Hernia Society, you also uh, have a contact with the surgeons from the countries that are not so rich and they have they can have a problem with for example buying a mesh well i think you know we in asia pacific cost uh, and the uh, economic situation really varies from uh, country to country and location yeah, sure. to location and also i would like uh, with a, a very clear understanding that i have used simple proline mesh as ipom and i'm talking about 94, 95, 93, 94, 95, and when we started. Mm -hmm. As I was saying that, that is the time, you know what, we started doing the surgery and we had no mesh, as I mentioned, apart from PTFE. And PTFE used to be maybe 20 times more expensive than proline, maybe 40 times more expensive, because it was very exclusive product at that time. So what we, we have done at that time, for primary hernias, at least I can very confidently say that at that time, taking a permission from the patient that we are doing it and the additions where possibility, we have done quite a few cases without much regret, I would say. And uh, uh, another thing which we have seen, yes, in some of the countries, but that we gave it up. When the newer generations came in, we, of course, we gave it up. But now what we see in some part of Asia, Asian countries, still people are using the proline mesh. Uh, in uh, in an IPOM technique 
at least for the primary repairs. And at least they have not come out with uh, bowel fistulation, etc. Not that in, in modern day, any one of us can advise the patient unless, you know, there is some country where you can possibly do it. So I feel that way. But yes, as uh, Salva said, that we can save a lot of uh, hospital stay. Now, as you see, all across, uh, all the hospitals have more number of operation theaters as compared to the number. Previously, I think the number of beds were very high. Number of operation theaters were less. But uh, I think we are more and more towards the daycare. <coughs> Insurance is not paying for long hospital stay. So I feel in long term, uh, it becomes only expensive when you start counting the laparoscopic equipment needed for laparoscopic surgery. But I have always maintained that laparoscopic equipment in any case, every surgeon is supposed to have because of yeah. the fall bladder, because of the hysterectomy, because of the appendix, because of, you know, so many things. So the cost, if you um, neutralize the cost of the equipment, simply by talking about the mesh, I don't think by opening the abdomen, closing the abdomen, itself becomes an expensive proposition. So yeah. I'm sure that is there, but shorter hospital stay, quick recovery, they can go back to work, will possibly compensate for the little the cost of, uh, of, uh, of the mesh. Yeah, okay. So uh, another one question, uh, uh, which is uh, now uh, coming because it seems that you have a different of all opinion. Um, Salva said that uh, to, to the uh, the tar is uh, safe and gives uh, the opportunities. And uh, on one slide of, of uh, Pridap, uh, we have heard that tar can give us a little bit instability because if you will cut the transversus abdominal uh, muscle, it's maybe not so uh, uh, not so good. It seems that it's not so uh, very big muscle and strong, but on the other hand, it plays a rule in the function. So the old question, what is a better anterior component separation or TAR? Because this question is still going on and uh, it seems that we do not have, or maybe it's like this, that for some patients this is better and for some patients this is better. Salva, what is your... Well, uh, I, I, your this is exactly what I tried to present that I think, you know, when we you want to divide any muscles and uh, you know, I think you have to be very careful. And second, my biggest apprehension is that we are today we are talking of a very short term, uh, uh, you know, follow up of these patients because you have already divided the origin and there is a gap and it's a paravertebral space. There is a big gap there. And we have seen internal herniations, the herniations taking through that because transversus is the innermost layer from where the hernia starts. So that area becomes weak and we have seen and those management of those cases uh, technically becomes a very uh, complex and difficult situation. That is one. Second thing is uh, I'm not very confident. I'm not very sure what will happen to the pulmonary functions of these patients. Maybe you today we talk about a young patient. Uh, mm -hmm. four or five centimeter umbilical hernia, primary hernia, and then you divide the tar muscle, uh, you do a tar, and then you know, the pulmonary com complex and compliance is um, uh, compromised. What will happen if the patient develops myocardial infarction, pulmonary edema, COPD, uh, chronic bronchitis, uh, maybe anaphylactic reactions, when he needs the, those accessory muscles. And I would uh, be very keen to know the pulmonary compliance of these patients. So you do PFT and uh, and the exercise test before, and when you divide the transverses and you do the test afterwards. And that will give us the real, it's not the hernia repair, but it is the, when you take and away the, the sinking. muscle, what it yeah. shows, because I would love anybody doing that sort of uh, uh, exercise and uh, investigations. Yeah, uh, Salva, short. We have two minutes, so if you can comment yeah. on this short. Well, uh, I, I like Tar. I like. Uh, I see the result of the patients, and, and the patient doesn't complain about any 
this stability of the world of pulmonary problems. Um, of course, I haven't done any quality control of, um, in terms of uh, functionality, but the patients are happy uh, because they were so bad and so uncomfortable with the big bulge before, with the big hernia. So they improved the quality of life uh, uh, impressively. So yeah, but after anterior component separation, we observe the same because they also have a big bulge and now they are really more happy because they don't have a hernia. So that's right. You know. so, so of course we have to do quality control in terms of how, uh, what is going to be better, but we don't have the answer. And in the future, you think, for example, like the patients uh, do not have any uh, problem, the pulmonary problem, but maybe it can influence um, the um, course of some uh, pulmonary or, or heart diseases in the future. P uh, Who knows? It's fact that we don't have a very long-term observation studies about this and this, yeah? Yep. And so uh, maybe a short comment. We, what will happen if we have now the, the COVID time and the patient without the uh, muscles will have maybe more problems? This is something like what we have also to consider sometimes, that maybe in the future there will be something that will influence them, you know? That's yep. it. Yeah. I think that's the time what we had for the questions. Thank you both very much. I would like also to thank uh, all the people that have been watching the webinar. And uh, again, thank you very much. Um, thank you for uh, for uh, for organizing it, and I will give uh, the voice back to the company. I also would like to thank you all uh, from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. This. Uh, so good evening, everyone. Uh, just to introduce myself, Namaste from India. My name is Krishnan. I lead the domestic business for uh, Merrill Endo Surgery, uh, parts of India and Nepal. Uh, the entire program, I think before I s tender the word of thanks, uh, it's it's great to have the doings of hernia surgery, you know, talk about things that interest us. And I'm glad to inform, you know, this is a, this is a first sort of a webinar that we are trying to do across the globe. And uh, we already have about 1500 people registered. So it's a grand success and it's largely because of the 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 KOLs here they've done a fab job they've that credibility uh, also like to talk about the fact that uh, uh, we at Merrill believe that education is the only way to lead uh, innovation and development in medical devices technology we have a Merrill Academy uh, in uh, Gujarat Wapi which uh, uh, Chobis had talked about uh, some time ago and uh, uh, we missed that thanks to the COVID we are unable to meet each other physically. Uh, but we're sure maybe another six to seven months down the line, uh, uh, we should be able to meet. Uh, there was a plan we were, we were trying to do a congregation once again, uh, like last time. But unfortunately, with COVID, uh, it's been a, a limitation. But look forward for more such engagements uh, uh, from our side. Uh, more than anything else, I think I should first thank, uh, start, begin by thanking all the COVID warriors, including the surgeons here who are risking their lives and saving so many of us. Uh, back home everywhere across the globe and including India. So from our side, you know, it's a big thank you. Thank you for serving humanity at this critical juncture. Uh, apart from that, I think I should uh, really thank from the bottom of the heart and from the team side, Dr. Salvador, uh, Dr. Smithinski to join us uh, from the uh, across the globe and uh, none other than Dr. Chobe uh, to take uh, some time out of his busy schedule and grace the occasion. Uh, uh, nothing better to have the doyen of laparoscopic surgery of India with us on any platform uh, to help most uh, people learn. So, and uh, above all, uh, I would also try to, uh, you know, thank my team who have tried to put this uh, uh, thing together. Thanks to the uh, digital platform, glad nothing, there was no glitch, everything went off smoothly, all the networks were great. Uh, with that, I think uh, if there are no more questions, uh, a glad thank you from our side and, uh, you know, until we meet again, and we see each other again. God bless everyone. Signing off from uh, India and Merrill Endo Surgery side. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir.